Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining this webinar. And today topic, today's topic would be freelancing and questions related to the, to the freelancing. Our guest this evening is Emil Atanasov, who has a lot of experience, almost over 13 years in <clears throat> designing, developing, and executing mobile projects and applications. And he's doing it since day one as a freelancer, probably, right? And he has a lot yeah. of experience. He managed to scale, <laughs> and now he is not alone. He has a couple of guys helping him in this freelance initiative, and he's very happy with what he's doing. So we'd rather we prefer to give the the voice to the <clears throat> to the guys who are doing it on a daily basis, right? And that will be Emil. I'm Sava, and I'll be helping this webinar. Guys, feel free to ask questions during the entire session. I'll be collecting them and asking Emil and other guests around. Uh, there will be like two sessions. The first one is for about an hour when Emil will present uh, what he prepared and then we'll be glad to answer your questions. So it will be Q&A session until we <coughs> finish all the questions. So thank you and good luck Emil. Thank you. Thank you, Sava. Hello, um, I'm Emil Atanasov. Uh, I'm a freelancer and I'll try to present what I know, what I have learned uh, in last 10 to 12 years uh, doing being a freelancer. And um, let's dive into it. Let's just first start with what is a Freelancer. It's a self-employment person. So you're probably a self-employed. You'll be working several jobs at a time, which means that you have uh, not just single employee employer, but couple of employers. So it's more like doing different projects for different people. Uh, usually you're going to charge per hour and get or get paid or just those small contracts. Uh, there is a minor disadvantage in the beginning. Usually the freelancers jobs are like short term, but that's not entirely true. Uh, when you have happy clients, they will want to work with you for more than a year and even more. So you'll be the one who decide when you want to end your contracts. So what we are going to learn in this lecture is what to expect if you decide to become a freelancer. I hope most of you are interested into that. What are the problems that a freelancer faces and how we, we can solve them? I'll give you some tips and tricks and different solutions to most common problems, but you have to face them. And I'll just share different techniques, how to become a really good uh, freelancer. Just to clarify, I'm, I'm more focused on software development, but I've been working together with uh, freelance designers uh, and uh, QAs, quality assurance. So there are different types of people. So don't worry if you, if you are not a software developer, you can become a freelancer doing what, what you can do. So what's the key when you should decide to become a freelancer? You have to be able to add a value. What does it mean? Um, it means that you can build something, a product, or you can do a service for someone who is ready to pay you. Well, in the beginning, it's hard to getting paid, but gaining uh, more experience and uh, happy customers and successful projects, uh, your pay rate will get better and better. So there, there are lucky stories. Even with your first job, you can land quite good payment, but it depends on your experience. So we'll discuss that in a bit. Um, what we should have in mind uh, if we want to compare a freelancing with a regular job? Well, they're not completely different, but still here are the key points that, that differentiate both. Um, 
in the beginning, you have to handle everything. So you'll be the one man show, the guy who is responsible for everything. You have to control it. You have to find clients' projects. You have to find time to execute those projects. You have to find time to learn new stuff. So a lot of things. And of course, this comes at the price. You have to invest more than 100% of your time. Usually when you start, it's, it's really hard. Um, but you, you can do it, do that slowly and steadily. So my personal experience was that I was a, a part-time student and I spent my free time working on different side projects. So this was like uh, 15 years ago. And at some point I decided that I, I can start looking for projects on my own. And this is how I become a freelancer. Before that, I, I had uh, someone who was looking for projects on my behalf and we were uh, splitting the, the payment. So the start is hard, but you can do it part-time. So if, even though if you have a full-time job, you can try to do part-time gigs or contracts after your working hours or on the weekend. You, you don't have to push too hard. I mean, be careful, don't burn out. Uh, but this is how you can start safely. So let's just dive um, into the key soft skills or skills that you should have uh, if you want to become a freelancer. Um, you can grow, you can develop those, but if you feel that some of them are not presented, then just work on those before trying to become a freelancer, your start will be way, way easier. So first key thing that I, I can stress is communication. You have to communicate freely. And usually most of the freelancers are working with uh, companies abroad, like me and my, my crew. So we are working uh, mostly with people from UK and uh, USA, some from Germany as well, but we use English on a daily basis. So uh, internal meetings, it's fine to be your, in your other language, but uh, when you have to communicate with clients and usually you have uh, several meetings a day with clients discussing uh, either projects or uh, new products or whatever, so you have to speak English. It's, it should be a decent level at least. Uh, and one, one thing from experience is that if you speak English uh, quite fluently, uh, the clients are more happy to trust uh, in you. So they feel you close. And if you have problems, no matter how good professional you are, then you have some some problems this this language barrier is is a stopper and if you have time just invest in improving your english so it's really key so english is the key for smooth communication and then i i will focus on uh, the soft skills like teamwork uh, creativity emotional intelligence work ethics so no matter that you're working alone most of the time, you have to be able to be a uh, team player because usually as a freelancer, you bring uh, experience that is not yet in the team or in the company or whoever is uh, getting in touch with you. So you bring in something new on the table and you have to have a way to share it with the other uh, team members. It's, it's really important. Yeah, in, in my start, I was working for um, a small agency in USA and they usually had a client and it was like a one-to-one -one communication, which was great. But later on, uh, while I was uh, gaining experience and more competence in mobile development, I had to consult bigger and bigger teams. So I had to join their meetings and uh, uh, describe what 
what's correct, what's not, uh, and share my experience from other projects. So it's it's really key thing to be able to communicate and to to share with the team. Of course, it's really important to have hard skills. Uh, I, I call hard skills, and uh, most of the freelancers call, call, call hard skills uh, the actual knowledge, the things you can do, the, the, your profession. So if you're a designer, a hard skill would be uh, to work with uh, Photoshop, for example, or with After Effects. Uh, if you're a developer, uh, working with React <clears throat> is your hard skill. So you have to have hard skills. This is the added value uh, to the project. Uh, don't forget to have good time management. I have a special slide. I, I want to stress on that as well. It's, it's really important. Once you um, get different projects, uh, at least one, then you have to find time to execute that project. And without good time management and self-organization, it, it's really hard. You won't have someone to push you, like on a regular job, because you have meetings, you have deliverables. It's like a following a path, a roadmap. And now you, you're responsible to do that on your own. So time management is, is really a key thing. And we shouldn't forget that proactivity uh, is a nice skill, good to have, but it, come with, it comes with the time. What does it mean? Well, uh, if you have a client and you see some problems in uh, his software, for example, or in the designs, or you have a better marketing strategy that, than what you see, you are proactive. You, if you propose different ideas, you bring those on the table, you, you say what in uh, what a way you can help. And this way the client starts considering booking you for another month or maybe a year in, in a good case. So proactivity will help you to secure more projects and more work long-term. Uh, key key point is how you should uh, value uh, your price or how much you should get paid. How much experience should you have? Or does it your, uh, how, how you should conclude how much you should charge your, your clients? Well, that's a complex thing to, to discuss. But let's let's try to break it down. So, on one on one hand, you have to have a your experience into account. So, if you you've been doing your job for a year, probably you, you won't be able to charge that much. But if if you have been doing uh, designing, for example, for five years, then you should reflect that in in your payment as well. You have to check what how huge is the market. What does it mean? Well, the market is uh, the place where you sell your services. And if you're selling somewhere where there is no competition, then you might, you might <clears throat> ask for higher price. But if there is a competition, usually the client who is look, looking for a freelancer could look for another one who is cheaper. So you have to adjust your rate. You cannot deviate that much from the mean. Uh, about the prices, I was always wondering, shall we start actually with something like middle ground? Because if you ask me, I would start with really low uh, price. But if you ask my wife, no offense, but she will be aiming for the highest. So. <laughs> <laughs> bottom line <laughs> should we jump in should we start somewhere in the middle ground or what would you recommend well it's it's good to explore how much the other freelancers or the the guys who are doing the, the same job are, are charging you shouldn't go below that i mean it's a complex thing but aiming for the the highest end it's 
it's not bad, but you find clients uh, quite rarely. I mean, not all the clients you meet could afford you. And in most recent cases, I, I see uh, some of the clients going to uh, Asia because the, the prices for software development there are quite low compared to what they pay in Eastern Europe. And that wasn't the case uh, like five, six years ago. I don't know, there is a shift. So if you go to really high prices, then probably you won't have clients. If you go for really low prices, then it's as well bad because a lot of clients will be coming and they will eat your time. And at some point you won't be able to deliver. So somewhere in between is probably the best. So I, I would say don't do bad deals, but we'll get to that point. And um, thank you. But again, in practical perspective, let's say I'm applying as a freelancer on a popular yeah. site as a entry entry level C sharp developer. What, what should I do? Should I explore all the let's say um, prices per hour from India and compete with them or do something different? How, how to approach that? What, what would you suggest here? Well, um, as a freelancer, usually you have to pay uh, different uh, share for taxes, etc. So if you know what's the average payment for a guy doing the same job in the same country, you could go for 75% of, of that thing. And I oh, guess you... That's quite insane. Insightful, yeah, so, right? 75% of the local market, yeah. right? So yeah, let's say yeah. that in Sofia, just let's say yeah. that the average uh, freelance uh, hourly payment would be how much? 20 euro? Sort of? Well, yeah, 20 is uh, for a mid-level, probably not for complete junior, but yeah, let's say it's 20. 20. So... So yeah. I should aim for 15 euro entry entry level. Yes. Yeah. That Excellent. Would be best. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, so you have to uh, think carefully whether you want to work on a fixed price price project. Well, this is discussion with the client, but usually either you work on a fixed price or a paperwork uh, projects, which means that uh, you send them an invoice with number of hours spent, you already negotiated the, the, the rate per hour, and then this forms the, the final uh, amount that you receive at the end of the month. So it's either recurring payment, which happens with the time, through the time, and uh, the other way is just a fixed one. Uh, some clients prefer fixed prices, some clients prefer uh, uh, paperwork so it's it's up to you but uh, again no bad deals if you believe that something costs a hundred and they just want to to buy it for 20 you shouldn't do the deal yeah let's let's move on yeah. we will cover that once more at the end of the presentation uh, again I'm going back to managing time but Self-motivation, organization, and time management, it's, it's really important. This is something that will push you forward and will help you to move on and to grow as well. Uh, and one tip which you think maybe it, it won't affect you in the beginning is to leave some of the work for tomorrow. Oh, that's not a bad thing. You're saving um, your effort and your time and you won't burn out, but it's good to do uh, the job that's planned for today today. Otherwise, when you have one or more, two or more clients at the same time, they, they're they usually um, urgent things and they start stacking up or piling up. And at some point, if you're just postponing your work, this work will swamp you up. So there will be no way to uh, postpone the stuff. So if you have just one client, it's fine. But when there's, when you start to having more than one, just do your work. What's planned for today on the same day? Don't postpone it. That's a good advice when you try to grow. And what about um, a working place? 
is it, is it good to have different working place or should I still sit at home and work on the same table where I eat, but on the other end, of course. <laughs> uh, well, my personal advice is just to have a different place, either rent a co-working space or just uh, if you have a couple of rooms in, in your apartment, then just say, this is my working room. I'll be focused here, I'll work from here. And don't, don't try to mix your free time with your working time. And at some point you will lose track. In the beginning, probably first two, three months, you'll be quite excited. You'll be pumped up uh, becoming a freelancer. There is a mind shift in your head, a lot of things. Uh, so it won't be a problem. But with the long run, if you're doing that for a year, two years, three years, it's, it's really bad to use a, a regular table. So you need a comfy chair like this one, for example, uh, a nice desk, uh, maybe two, three displays and a uh, stand-up desk as well. So it depends what are you doing, but it would be nice to have a separate place to work. And co-working spaces, uh, they're as well good because, uh, you know, you go there to uh, do work and as well, you have some uh, social moments, you get in touch with different people, colleagues. So mm, the social moment is quite problematic once you start working with uh, remote uh, clients. Yeah, it's maybe the, uh, the one thing that I really miss from being a regular worker, but there are ways to, to solve that thing. So why contacts or networking is, is really important and uh, how to find my first project or what, how I, I will land up a, a good stream of work. So this happens with the time. The, the first, finding your first project is probably the hardest thing, but I'll, I'll share some tips and tricks at the end of the, the presentation uh, where you can go, which sites or platforms you can use to, to find your, your first project. Once you have your first project, then everything just starts like the snowball effect. You get more and more projects and they will help you to find more and more uh, customers if you do your job outstandingly. So the contacts, or your initial network is, is really important. Well, in nowadays with uh, this pandemic, it's not that, that important. There are a lot of uh, virtual channels, but before that it was a different time and having a strong, strong network would help you to, to find your first projects quite easily. Uh, and how to create contacts in, in these, these days. So you have to have a social, a network presence. So you have to spend time uh, marketing yourself. We'll go through all dot points later. Um, you need proper introductions, which means that you have to share that you're becoming a freelancer to your friends and probably they will share to their friends. So you have like uh, exposure, big exposure to uh, different people that I'm becoming a freelancer. I know, for example, Python, or I, I know machine learning or whatever fancy technology and that I've been working for like two, three years on the market and I have some experience and I'm ready to start for some payment. Well, the payment is negotiated a bit later, but this way you <clears throat> share that thing with your friends and your friends are going to, to share for their way for you. And the other point that will bring you new clients are the, the happy, happy clients or the happy customers. So when you have one happy customer, he'll probably share to two to five other happy customers or he will refer you. But when you disappoint one client or a customer, then he'll share that with more than 10. And he's, this is, quite emotion, but people are, are mean when they get emotional. So try to make happy clients, uh, no matter the payment, but try to get paid as well. But you're um, being, a, delivering successful project is most important thing than getting paid because you build your reputation uh, with a lot of effort and through the time and ruining it could, could be quite 
cheap. So don't push for the money. If someone doesn't want to pay, um, uh, the, you don't have a contract, just going to the court, suing him might be a, like suicide. Uh, you have to put on pause your freelancing career, etc. So just you have to consider that thing. You, you're working for uh, yourself and for your uh, face in front of all the clients. So try to find to deliver projects to have happy clients and this will bring you new projects which will be successful. Uh, and one last thing that I want to, to cover is um, try to participate in open source projects. This is like a no matter whether you're a software developer or not, just participating in an open source initiatives um, brings you a quite huge exposure to different groups of people. Most of those are uh, interested in hiring you. So it's a great opportunity if you take part of one of those or at the universities or wherever you can advertise your skills. So in the beginning, it's it's really hard. It was uh, similar for me. The first project I, I landed was a side project from the university. It was some sort of European uh, project. We were developing, we were writing Java. It was it was hard, but this is how I started thinking that I can work. I can work. This was before I become a, an actual freelancer. So. We covered the contacts and how to find your first project. We'll discuss that in details at the end of the, the lecture, which platforms we can use, but try to share your idea with uh, your friends. Don't forget to do that one. Say what you probably want to say to potential uh, buyer, a client, and they will pass it through their connections. And this way you might land uh, quite suddenly on a project and which will be your first step uh, towards freelancing. So the other key point uh, is, uh, should I have a contract or not? And here I want to share my, my experience, which is I've been working without contracts. I've been working with contracts and in both cases, you might not get paid. So a contract is not a silver bullet for getting paid. It depends, a lot of things might happen. So let me just uh, share an example. This was quite fresh one last uh, summer. We were working with a free uh, startup, uh, a Germany-based startup. A friend of mine had secured uh, funding and they were building a mobile app uh, and they wanted someone to consult them to, to make that Android app. Uh, Quite good. <clears throat> so uh, they hired a senior developer uh, guy from our crew, and we worked with them for like three months. And we said that they will be paying us at the end of each month. And we send them the invoices. We'll cover those bits later. And uh, the last. Well, we sent three, three invoices. The last two haven't been paid because uh, they bank went bankrupt. So no matter whether we had a contract, there was nothing more to do um, because they had no money. They uh, wind down the, the company. So it is what it is, just bad luck. So be mindful when you decide with whom you shall work and if you know that you cannot survive without the money from that contract, then it is like a red sign, don't do it, don't do it, be careful. So what about working without contracts and uh, getting, getting paid? So this is probably the, the, good, the good side. So if you really trust those people, or well, you shouldn't, it's good to have a contract but uh, if you really trust, you can start working on a project immediately. But try to sort out the contract thing in next two, three weeks. Don't, don't commit more than a month work because if something goes wrong, then you won't get paid. And it's 
in the beginning gets hard. Once you, you've been working for like six months or a year, you probably accumulate some money in your bank account and you might survive longer. But before having any money and just uh, um, spending your savings, it's, it's not a good practice. Yeah, you build trust when you trust the other side without a contract. But in the long run, this might hurt you. <clears throat> so my tip here is just be sure that you have savings for three months without any projects before you, you starting or uh, making uh, a step towards becoming a freelancer. Just save some money and then move or, or do it uh, like I have done it. Just do it uh, side by side by your regular work. This way it will cost, it will eat your free time, but you know what you're, you're doing. You want to change your lifestyle, become a freelancer, then you can afford uh, working uh, three months or, or more uh, side by side on, on small projects. So the, the sweetest part of becoming a freelancer probably is to send your invoice. You've done the job, you've uh, landed a project, you've executed the project quite well, and at some point you, you have to get paid. So you need a good template. So the invoice is the document that you send, and based on that document, you will get paid. So you need a good template. It's, it's like in a coffee shop when you order a, a drink and then they serve it nicely then you tip them so if you have a nice template and you make it with a style then the, the client will be happy and will return you shouldn't be rude so this is the, the the point when you get the money and you should make them feel happy that they then they haven't wasted their money so it's it's really important for keeping a good relationship and getting more and more clients <clears throat> Uh, don't forget to check uh, the regular uh, uh, local regulations and laws. So if you're doing job for um, a company that's located in the UK, for example, you have to check whether you have to pay some taxes, extra taxes. Is it uh, considered as, a, as an export or different topics? But uh, I cannot help you on that matter. You need a legal advisor here and one who is familiar with your uh, local laws and regulations. So if you, you're working, so um, it's quite popular to become a digital nomad in, in recent days. So those are people who are freelancers and who are um, traveling and working together. So right now with uh, this pandemic, it's, it's hard to be executed properly, but still you could do it if you push hard. So you have to be careful how long you stay in a different country, because if you work there for more than six months, then you have to um, keep, uh, or you have to comply the, the laws of that uh, country of residence you have for more than six months. So if you're planning to become a digital nomad, so it's a freelancer who travels, then you have to keep that in mind. Uh, so you, sh well, there is a, like a cheat here, you could have uh, your company uh, established in your uh, country and you travel abroad and you uh, sign all the contracts from your company. So there are ways around it, but you have to discuss that with a legal advisor. And about the invoice, most of the invoice is, um, or the price, is negotiated at the beginning of the project, but the actual amount of hours, if you uh, get paid per hour, is uh, added to the invoice at the end. And don't forget to sync when a client will be able to, to pay. So it, it's like not all companies are paying straight away. So if you issue an invoice, you it might take a, a month to get paid. So keep in mind that thing. So it takes some time from issuing the invoice, sending it to the client and uh, getting the money in your bank account. That's why I, I, I try to stress 
uh, on the previous slide that you need some money to survive. <clears throat> so what is uh, the difference between a freelancer and a small business or small firm? So um, the difference is that um, you build your portfolio or successful projects much rapidly because a couple of people are working together and they team up and you can uh, land on bigger projects. For example, uh, in the beginning, I, I was working on my own, which meant that I, I could take just projects which uh, uh, <clears throat> are only mobile, strictly mobile with a few technologies. Uh, initially it was just Android, then I moved to iOS because the market was better developed, the customers were more interested in getting an iOS app and then they wanted to move to the Android world. So I already knew Android, so it was quite easy to transition to iOS. And then when they look for an, an Android uh, developer, I, I could uh, take the same project. So it, it was a smart move to, to change the market. And it was really hard uh, for me because I, I couldn't build my, my portfolio easily, and we, which meant that I, I was missing different projects. And if I had a <clears throat> people to work with, then probably we, we would get um, more projects or bigger ones. For example, right now we have a QA uh, and a designer in the company and we can land a full project from end to end because we have people with different competences. And before that, when I was the only developer, I just, even though if they propose me a big project, I, I could just do the development part and nobody would do the QAing and so they should look for another company or other freelancers to help me. And it, it's hard to manage. So. Moving from a freelancing to a small business, is, it's something reasonable, but you have to be prepared. So it's not to do it at the, the day one. And if you want to do it at day one, then probably you're thinking to, to co-found a startup. It's not that far away from freelancing, but it's, it's different. And my advice is just focus on becoming a freelancer, get a better understanding what you're capable of, improve your soft skills, uh, the things which we covered uh, in the beginning, and then you're um, like a couple of steps ahead if you want to found a company, to start a company. So if you want to move to a small business, then you have to either have a steady flow of work or you have to have a good team of people who you trust and you know that they can work side by side with you. Otherwise, just having some money and trying to find the best people and clients at the same time, it's a huge struggle in the beginning. I'm not saying it's not impossible. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it's, it's really hard. So how to market you yourself as a freelancer or how to land this this first project of yours how how to share with the world that you're good at something and you are ready to deliver and someone who needs your skills will hire you well you have to have a decent portfolio or a cv in the beginning there is a difference. I'll, I'll try to clarify that one. A, a nice site. And if you're going to have a meetings face in face, then you need a, a good business card. So what is a CV and what's a portfolio and what's, what's the difference? So everyone uh, probably who is here has created a CV. So the CV is a document that captures your skills and the Portfolio is like a tangible proof that you can use, like a document that proves, not only document, but in most cases, it's a document that summarizes all the projects that you have been working on. 
you can add those into the CV, but the idea of the portfolio is just to prove that it works. So uh, if I'm a designer and uh, I'm not, <laughs> but if I'm a designer, imagine that uh, I would create a, a huge PDF showing different techniques, different so products, different things that I have created on my own with my own hands. If <clears throat> as a developer, uh, it's good to have a GitHub account or any uh, open source uh, code sharing system would do like GitLab or Bitbucket, but GitHub account is a good place uh, where you can develop your project, your first project, not, not first project, your project or an open source project or whatever, and just showing that to the world, sharing it with the world. So uh, a while ago, <clears throat> I started a blog and I was working on native extensions, uh, flash native extensions. Uh, and I, I decided to open source some of those. And there was quite uh, attraction uh, from different people. And they was reading my blog and they got in touch and they asked me to work together. So having something on GitHub is like a, a proof that you can do develop something and uh, don't don't be mean uh, and don't copy other works and uh, present it present those as your own that's that's a bad thing and that will ruin your reputation so don't do that just try to invent stuff or build stuff on your own yeah you can uh, get ideas get inspiration from other places but be sure that it's it's yours the code the the rights are it, they belong to you don't don't try to cheat and what else should you put on your portfolio so in the beginning everyone should be able to create a cv through the time building different projects or working on different projects sharing those with the world you should be able to convert your cv and build a portfolio you can have both of those and if you are working with a couple of friends then building a portfolio will be quite easier because they have different experience dif different competences so you can build that together so if imagine if you're a team of three three developers or two developers and a designer then your for port sorry may i ask uh, how you find your first uh, customer this is well, the most difficult usually. Yeah, the, the first customer, it was quite a luck. We, we, we were just uh, looking for a customer a couple of days and we went to a, a forum and there was a, like an ad. I'm looking for a Flash developer. It was from Florida. Uh, and we decided we should just share our experience and our CVs with that guy and we send it and we got a response well in next three or four hours because of the time difference and it was like well this was a one shot thing but it 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 was a luck and we tried a couple more times and there was no response or a negative response so you have to try you, you shouldn't give up uh, this was kind of by chance the first time. But before that, I have been working on uh, different side projects and I have built, I've been building my uh, CV for like four years. So I wasn't quite fresh. I, I have spent some time working as a flash developer. So I guess this is why they decided to trust us. So if you want to, <clears throat> start without that much experience. In my case, it was more like three, four years of uh, development. Uh, then you have to go to <clears throat> different companies, well, get in touch with different companies. They, they have intern positions, which means that you can join that company getting paid way less than, than usual. They, they don't pay much for intern or you do uh, some internship for um, like two, three months without getting paid. It depends on 
uh, on the company. If it's a startup, they won't pay you. If it's something proven, then they could pay you something. Uh, so it's good to start there. Uh, you'll be uh, like a consultant, external workforce, but you gain knowledge, you improve your communication, and you, in the end, if you everything is su successful, then you have this successful project and you have your startup, your a good startup, your portfolio. So just looking for different companies, getting in touch with contacts uh, or some someone in your market, if you're a developer or a designer, that would help you land on uh, your first project. It's, it's really the hardest thing because you don't have much experience finding clients, but with the first client, the things improve. And there are always uh, people looking to start their new business, online shop or whatever. And they're ready to trust uh, someone who will be kind of cheap uh, or cheap for the services. So that's that's your sh uh, chance to, to take that thing. <clears throat> One uh, well, other, other else? question. Yeah. Uh, can you share about the uh, effect of uh, the confidence? Uh, uh, yes, uh, there is uh, the skills, but uh, yeah. how the confidence uh, influence uh, your relationship uh, with uh, customers and marketing as a freelancer? <laughs> well, th there is one rule. Don't promise things you cannot deliver. This is the only rule which if you don't break, then the confidence uh, you build that confidence. So if you if you promise things that you're pretty sure that you cannot deliver, you no matter how much confidence you have, you you just um, do it once, twice, and the third time the client the clients are not stupid. <laughs> they 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 evaluate everything. They they usually uh, look for a couple of freelancers. So there is hidden competition, even though you don't know. Usually, uh, someone who wants to hire a freelancer already explored the market for at least a week or a month. So, don't try to promise things you cannot deliver. And being more confident that comes with the time, with the experience, and as well uh, with the communication skills. So, if you, you if you're confident that you speak good English, you your English is fluent, then this is a confidence. So. It matters, but you, you, if you are too confident, promise too many things and you do not deliver, it's, it, you're like a hot air in, in a balloon. So you're just fake thing. So being too confident is not bad. It could help you land on uh, bigger projects, but don't ruin the rule to promise things that you cannot deliver. That's the showstopper. Thank you, Emil. So if you mention it, you mentioned it, but again, if we are, let's say, a backend developers, right, we cannot demonstrate any fancy designs or whatever, right? We just have a code. Uh, and you, <coughs> pardon me, you encourage us to, to go for the GitHub, right? And to create some yeah. projects. Yeah. Uh, I can share a successful, recent successful story with a colleague of mine who started sure. to develop... Um, examples and sample codes for security practice by security practices in .NET Core, right? And yeah. he started to publish them in, in a public repository. He got contacted yeah. from a big bank, right? Yeah. <laughs> who, who invited him to, to do the security audit on application level for them and he's getting a lot of money out of it, right? That's good. Yeah. Well, I would definitely say sharing with the community will pay off in the long run so in the beginning you have to accumulate some knowledge some some good practices something to share but at some point when you have plenty of those just try sharing those don't be shy and someone will find that interesting and like you said Sava uh, it could be your next contract or even long-term partnership you, you never know but without sharing, you, you don't get that exposure and no one can figure out that you're really a, a bright guy, a smart guy and, or a great designer. You're just 
no one, nobody knows you, no matter how good you are. And communication is, uh, is a key thing. Sharing with friends, people. So you can, you can think of uh, sharing uh, knowledge with the community, open source community, or different meetups, uh, meetings. It's like other version of the communication. It's like broadcasting. Hey, come and see me. I'm, I'm, I'm really good at that thing, and I can prove it to you. So you, it has to be, uh, it has to be, it has to have a proof. You have to have a proof. Without a proof, it's it just nonsense. Yeah, the, the the clients, like I said, they're quite smart. Even though they 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 are not playing smart when they're talking with you, they have checked everything at least two or three times. And if they know that you're a fake, they they won't. Uh, continue working with you and this will be a bad advertisement so it might affect you well with this global market it's it probably not a it's not a too too much of a, a problem but we never know okay so i want to to share a couple more things to the portfolio um, that you, you should try to add try to put examples of your best projects the things that you're out of so if you have done quite shiny react app or you have created a, a stunning book for a not that great author but you're really proud as a designer with, with that thing put it at the beginning of your portfolio it's something new and fresh and shiny and uh, the guys who are talking with you when they see something as a proof uh, of your skills and they like it then you're the guy that they want to to hire then uh try to to add some statistics so if you're a uh, developer and you have a, an open source project or you have been working for one delivering for example imagine that you you're really good at uh node.js and you have contributed for node.js framework uh so you have to put that at the beginning of, of the <clears throat> portfolio as well and just add the number of downloads of that framework or how popular is it and that it's eating the the or it's disrupting the the backend uh, services so it's moving a lot more companies are moving to node.js at the minute so you're one of the contributors of that technology so many many companies are using what you have done so it's it's really a great start um describe your approach well i i wouldn't be quite thorough on that in the portfolio, but I'll try to sketch uh, my approach, how we work with the client. So um, there are different clients, different styles of work, but one thing that I, I prefer is to keep the client updated. So uh, it's um, something that bigger companies uh, practice, but uh, not only the big companies, so any freelancer could do it. And this is uh, automation, uh, continuous integration and automation. So I would prefer to share builds. Imagine that we are working on a, on a mobile app. I would prefer to share builds pretty much every day with the client so he could see the application, experience it on his own in his free time on his own phone, not sharing once a week or once a month. It's, it's stupid. I mean, today everything is too, too dy dynamic. And it's good to share the good practices, typical for big businesses. It's so how you do that. You go read, understand good practices, and then you try to up, apply those in your day-to-day -day processes. And when you figure out that something is good, you bring it from one client from one or one relationship to another one. And if that client approves it, then he'll be happy. So... Try to just sketch the, the key things that stand out from a typical software developer, if you're a software developer freelancer in your portfolio. <clears throat> and don't forget to add uh, testimonials or, or references. Uh, this is uh, what uh, the guys who have been working with you think about you and your processes and your deliverables. So this should be part of your portfolio education and achievements that that's part for the cv but you could add it to the portfolio if you want to to make it look massive 
So focus on those those things. Now let's let's continue with the the how to market. But having a strong portfolio and a site to advertise, it's it's a great start. Then you should spend some time uh, on uh, social media and those social media is not Facebook. Well, you could use Facebook, but I would I wouldn't. I, I would prefer to, to use LinkedIn or a Stack Overflow or Reddit. Those are uh, so, social places where you can share your experience and your, your knowledge. So those are channels that it's you have to be there. Uh, there are a lot of guys who, who are hunting, headhunting or looking for a freelancers from there. And just try to, to be presented. How you should approach that thing? Well, at the beginning, you shouldn't go for all of those. Just focus on your portfolio and your CV. Then you can build your site. We'll just incorporate the information from the portfolio and the site. And then you can focus on building a good GitHub and then good LinkedIn profile, but just build one from start to end and then try to use that uh, information in, on all other channels. Yeah, in the end, you're just a single person or a small company and um, you have to <clears throat> reflect the, the reality. Um, let's, let's discuss different ways of communicating with, with the client. Um, and how to manage projects. So usually clients, they, they are not <clears throat> well educated. Not all of the clients, sorry. Not all of the clients are well educated how to lead a project or which uh, tools to use to communicate. So I, I have different clients. Some, some are using tools like from 90s some are way modern. I'm trying to, to push all of the clients to, to the same channels or quite similar ones. So it's, it's up to you. So if you don't push them, they will stick to emails uh, and that might be confusing thing. You, it, it happens to lose an email or uh, the client to forget to send it or something like that. So it's, it's good to, to use something modern. Uh, like Slack or, or Teams um, and to keep track of everything. But don't forget that you, you can use um, different tools for organization, organizing the project like Trello. Uh, there are other alternatives, but Trello is one of the most popular one for, for small teams and freelancers. It, it's perfect. Uh, I'll show it at the end. <laughs> and as well, if you are working through an agency, this is another way to start easily in the beginning. Uh, it, the agency usually uses uh, internal ways of communicating with, with the client. They usually ask you to use their um, email. They create you, a, for example, Gmail account or whatever. And they, in front of the world, it looks like you're working for on behalf of the agency, but in the real world, you're a freelancer who gets contract through that agency and uh, the agency keeps a share. So uh, keep in mind that the agencies or the big companies, if you join those, they will ask you to, to have more than uh, one email or different channels. So it's good to accept those uh, ways of communications, not to push for the old Skype or whatever you stick to. Uh, but as well, on the other end, if you have a client without much experience, try to push the good practices uh, through that channel as well. Now, uh, let's step back and discuss how we close a deal or what's the, the last step before closing a deal. So you probably will have a meeting with, with a client. You'll discuss uh, project details and then you get back home and you prepare uh, a proposal. So the proposal is a, an official document that uh, contains uh, details about the project and to what you will deliver at what price. So this is what 
what are the, the terms of the deal. It's not a final thing that the client will sign. Probably you will further negotiate, but <clears throat> this is the thing that you already know. Sorry. This is the thing that you already know you'll be de <clears throat> delivering. One, one key thing here is don't accept bad deals. So when you send a proposal, don't, don't adjust the terms of the proposal, the proposal to meet your client needs at all costs. What does it mean? Um, if you know that the work will be like a hundred hours and you charge uh, 10 euros per hour. So it, it's, it's that price, the minimal price that you should get paid to be happy. If you want to get that contract, you, you can slash the price halfway. And this, this will be an awesome offer for the client, but in, in the long run, you won't be happy with that project. And this is a burden that it's, it's really huge burden that will prevent you being successful. So you won't be happy. You won't deliver if another client who pays more pops in, then you'll be distracted. So a lot of bad things will happen. So don't try to make promotions in the beginning. Just you have to know the, the minimal price of a project and then just strive for more than that one. If if you want to land that project and to have it, then it's it's not a good thing to to go below that baseline. So keep the baseline. Don't don't accept bad deals. And if you accept a good deal, you'll be much happier and you deliver outstanding results and you get happier clients which will bring you new projects so try to when you're building your proposal try to consider that thing so i have that price in mind if i get paid that much and i deliver it then uh, i'll be happy the client will be happy so yeah i'm seeing that it's quite dark here now it's not better. Maybe you can switch off the camera, Emil. Uh, it's breaking up a bit. Okay. We already saw you, so it's perfectly fine if you switch it up. Handling common issues. So what kind of issues you could face? Uh, where to, to find your first client? Um, yeah, that's quite typical. We already said that one option is to uh, start with a company that's looking for interns, uh, freelancers, or a startup. So just building a, your portfolio. The other thing is, let me just try to, to share different platforms. Okay. Have to exit that thing and go to Firefox. So this is the first place where I would go. So this is Stack Overflow. It's quite popular if you're a developer, if you're a designer, then it won't do the job. But <clears throat> this is their portal for, for sites. So you can just pick remote, then you can pick different <clears throat> technology skills you have. And then whether you're looking for a contract, internship, and then just look for, and there are a lot of, recently there are a lot of remote uh, ads here. So this is one place. There are plenty of those, but this is quite popular because all the all, all the developers are going here, are going to Stack Overflow to check answers. And so the headhunters know that it's a popular place. So they come here to look for great talents. Then the other thing is there are a lot of uh, Slack communities. So this is one for the iOS developers. There is European Dev Explorer. There is this one for UX designers. I'll share those links later. Uh, there is freelance lead. So those are places um, which have a Slack community. So a lot of people are participating in like a public chat and there are uh, different chats for um, job offerings. So let me just try to open one. I, I joined one. 
today. So this is a reactive flux. So it's related to React jobs. And uh, currently I'm, I've opened uh, the job channel. And here, people who want to be hired just uh, tag the, the advertisement. So they advertise their skills. So you could post your profile here. And as well, there are people who are hiring. So here you, you can meet your potential client. So th there are a lot of things here. I mean, constantly, like you, you saw, I, I had to scroll till I find the, the most recent one, but a lot of uh, ads are, are coming here. And you get in touch straight away with, with that guy, for example, or the guy who is looking and you can just discuss the opportunity and see if, if it's a match. So this channel and any of the other Slack uh, communities are quite helpful to get to land your first project. Should I quit my regular job? Well, in the beginning, I said it's it's good not to quit straight away. Just try to work on your portfolio, on your projects. Uh, try to land on a part-time project just to see how it goes, whether you like it or not. If the freelancing is something that you will like or not. And yeah, don't don't jump straight away. It's it's. It's acceptable, but it's way more risky. But then another question, how to scale? So you see that you have one contract, which uh, is close to, to end and how you can find more projects or more clients. And this, this comes with the time, but all the channels you use to launch your first project, you can use them over and over again. And with the improved portfolio, this will help you to, to scale. Happy clients means that you build longer relationships and you get more and more projects with the time. Uh, another quite common question is when I can get paid twice the amount I charge right now at, at day one? Well, it depends. It's, it's up to you. You define the pace, you learn, you build, uh, products uh, you grow so it's tightly related to your growth for some people it might take like three months to six months it, it depends and for some people it might take more than three years well it depends as well on your initial rate so if it's like five bucks then probably with your second project you you get twice the rate but if it's 50 bucks <laughs> what about that it's, it's really hard. It's really hard if you're looking for really insane uh, rates. Uh, as well, I want to stress, don't do bad deals. Bad deal is a deal that you accept because you need money or you want to have that deal. And in the long run, it, it will cost more than what you anticipated. So this is like a definition of a bad deal. So try to say no. If you try to charge too much as well, the client might say no. So the bad deal on the other end is as well something that the client won't do. So keep that in mind. The, the bad deal rule works for both sides. Um, don't forget to sign contract. Usually people dive straight into work, you have to have the rule. You can commit two, three weeks a month at most without a contract. Otherwise, you won't get paid anything. In, there is a high probability you won't get paid in the end. So try to sign at least some sort of a contract. Uh, if you're using agency or any of the portals, uh, well, like a top tower, uh, uh, other services they, that act as a agency, they will um, cover that for you. 
But if you are going straight to a client, then you should be prepared with a template of a contract. And uh, one point from uh, my experience is don't sign DNAs that will uh, prevent you building your, your dream product. If you think to work on something similar, so imagine that you want to build a uh, next Mario game, well, not Mario, but something uh, jump and run for a mobile phone. And then you're quite experienced uh, developer. You have a designer in the team and you have that, that great idea. And someone is uh, coming to hire you for a similar idea and you have to sign NDA. This will block you for at least a year doing something similar. Well, it depends on the NDA. It might be for three years, even worse. So if you dream for something to work on and you get a client that wants to pay for similar work, then you might be in trouble if you sign the wrong NDA in the long run. So keep in mind. Um, is, there a, is there a workaround for that? Let's say <clears throat> something yeah, stupid, are, are. which I did in the past, right? I signed an NDA as a physical person, right? As a person? Yeah. And then the same project as a company. They cannot yeah. be correlated. So there is well, a work around. Yes. If you have a company, uh, it, it depends. You can find a, a hole in, in that. But yeah, you have to be careful. Like, because sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes the, the, the restriction to a company, or it depends how the NDA is formulated, but the restrictions which apply to a company apply to all the, the workers. And even though you're a founder or CEO, you're just under those causes. So you have to be careful. I, I would advise to um, take advice from a legal person. They know their stuff. But yeah, there are workarounds. So uh, once you have more than one client or more than 10, I would advise to use customer re relationship management tool. So this is CRM in short. So this is a software. Well, in nowadays it's more like a site where you put all your details for your customers and what kind of projects you're working with. And this helps you organize your sales, improve uh, the customer, satisfaction, keeping the dialogue open with, with your customers, be organized on your end. And don't forget all your old clients that might be happy. <clears throat> so in the long run, if you have many clients and in the beginning, usually you do small projects. So the clients are just piling up. So it's good to keep track of, of those. They might refer you, it's, they're good good connections. So the CRM, there are free, free services. You can use that one. And in, in the real beginning, you can just keep a spreadsheet. Uh, that would do. But yeah, using such a software is beneficial when you start to have more than 10 um, customers, or if you want to, to look more professional with uh, different emails, uh, celebrating, uh, sending celebration for different events. So it's a good thing. Making a freelancing full-time job. Well, if you like it, then you probably should scale and uh, leave your day-to-day -day job and become a full-time freelancer. When you should do that, you will know that the time is good when you have either a steady client or more than one project and you don't have the time because of your day-to-day -day job. So you start to understand that thing. Uh, what will be like a disadvantage if you become a freelancer and full-time? Well, you won't work just eight hours. You have too many things. Well, there might be months without that much work, but there might be months with a lot of projects uh, going simultaneously. So you have to be prepared to 
survive such months. And as well, if you are a good manager, you manage the things nice, then this stress will be reduced massively, but this comes with the time and with the confidence. So you shouldn't commit things that you cannot deliver. In the beginning, when you become a full-time freelancer, you'll be the one-man show. So you have to think for invoicing. You have to think for contracts. You have to think for advertising your services. You have to do the work. So a lot of things. It might be stressful at the very beginning, but I think this presentation should help you understand all the parts that you should know and feel a bit confident or at, at least uh, not scared. And uh, you, you can use the time to dive into that thing. It's a lifestyle. The, the freelancing is not a remote working. I, I, I think there is slight difference between a freelancer and a remote worker. The remote worker is a guy who is working at home, but he has to go to the company from time to time, etc. And the freelancer is a guy who, who is working uh, at several places at a time on different contracts. So it's way more dynamic. If you're looking for a remote work, then there are a lot of companies that could propose that one. The freelancing is a bit more than that. It, it requires a different skill set. Um, let's talk briefly about uh, the different channels. So I already showed a couple of those track, uh, like Reactive Looks and their Discord <clears throat> channel. Uh, but I want to cover Fever and Upwork, which are a uh, marketplace for services. And TopDAO. TopDAO is an agency as well. Just if you hold on, I can show you. I, I found. Uh, a new one and I'm, I'm in the process of registration. It's this one, Turing. And uh, I have created my profile, uploaded the CV, etc. put all details here, what I've studied, etc. And now they have <clears throat> these tests. So you just take this test, you prove that you know React you prove that you know Java, PHP, or whatever additional skills. And they, as a service, try to find your first client. So this is more like an online agency. You can further read about it. But the idea is <clears throat> it's a service to help you find your, your first project. And become are, they, a are they helping you <clears throat> with the rates? Or it's up to you again? Well, I think you, you have some control. I think they add on top of you because uh, especially... This they have a margin, I guess. Yes, yeah. And they, they operate in Silicon Valley and the, the pay rates there are quite high. So, yeah, you can put a really high... Uh, rate for yourself and they can still find a, a company that will hire you. But it, it's up to them. I mean, if you push too high, then probably it will be hard for you. But they, how about they have the, this the, test. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, please. Sorry. Yeah, they, they, have, they have the same tests like TopDAO and Sab, I know that you've you've been going through similar things a while ago. Can you share your experience? Yeah, the, uh, the, the exams, there were seven, seven levels of exams, right? Uh, <clears throat> the first was general, general IT knowledge and comprehension, like stru data structures, algorithms, and so yeah. on. Just to mention that I was applying for, and I managed to get them, to get the, for senior development manager, engineering manager, and mm -hmm. still the questions were all around. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the first, so the first one was very technical: uh, data structures, algorithms, general knowledge about infrastructure, and so on. Then, if you pass that, you have a technical assignment, 
which is a project that you need to deliver in three days and it's not easy, right? Um, done in any technology you might like. And then there was the project management, sorry, product management exam, right? Where and again, practical uh, exam, you have three days to deliver a certain product management stuff, right? To calculate budgets, risk and so on, whatever. Then there was the English test, and then finally there is there was an interview one on one, right? Yeah. And when you pass all these seven exams or something, you end up in a marketplace where you keep waiting for someone to hire you uh, within this ecosystem of clients they have. So I invested in total three months. Can you imagine <laughs> three months? Compare that to the local market, right? But again, the money are very, very different. <laughs> very different. Yeah. Well, I think that if you're confident with your hard skills, so the knowledge, the, the technologies, or uh, the, if you're a designer, the, the stuff you do with Photoshop or other tools, then it, it will take some time. But the difference you get and you get a security for clients because once you, you prove that you're good, <clears throat> uh, the, this agency will strive to find uh, different projects for you because they earn on top of you. So yeah. if you deliver 100 hours, then they earn X amount of money and they will be happy to find your work for next month and next month. They are just... Now I remember something important about these agencies, right? Uh, yeah. When I landed in and when I got hired, uh, I was able to observe all the marketplace and all the applicants, right? So there were like 10,000 engineers per week, right? Really? But yes, 10,000 worldwide. But only, but only 1% of them managed to get into the marketplace. And the reason is not because of the... Uh, of the exams of the test they are not so hard just the people are not uh, usually the people are not so uh, you know willing to to put so much efforts into that right and what i would encourage everyone is don't give up even if you fail on the second phase or something in some of the tests just take it over in one month late give it a try again and again and again until you're there just don't give up yeah, I would say the same. Don't quit. Don't be a quitter. Just try to, to find around it. Be proactive. Look, look for a solution. Be solution driven. So, yeah. Like and, said, and moreover, yeah. moreover, uh, because uh, when I passed all these exams, then I, I was on the other side, right? <laughs> like a hiring manager. So, uh, yeah. all the guys around, they're willing to help you. They're not willing to let you go because. Uh, you know, they're making money out of you. So ask them for feedback directly. I saw a couple of proactive guys back then who on the second test or something, they immediately asked the agency, what, what, what went wrong? Why did I fail? And all of us, we were happy to have a chat with the guy and to explain him or her where he failed. So do that. Ask for feedback in case you cannot pass the exam or something or the technical test and everybody will help you. Yeah, when I have been doing technical interviews, usually at the end of the meeting, I, I just spend some time to, to clarify the missing bits, if there are any, and how the guy could improve just to, to keep the, the good uh, yeah. discussion. Yeah, so... It's, it's really in important. this case yeah in this case it's a bit different because uh, it's a machine who checks the results right there are no humans uh, it, you just submit your code yeah. and there is a processor uh, a software which checks the result so there are no humans <laughs> in these first phases but you should ask for uh, feedback in case you fail or how to how to improve myself what should I do yep and let's and... say uh, when I was observing such cases, I saw that there were missing some unit tests or something. So I'm usually providing feedback. Please add 
this number of unit tests to your project or uh, you know slice the code don't do it monolithic whatever yeah it's, it's technical stuff but yeah it, it's good to to ask for a feedback and based on that feedback you have to come come back home do your homework and then try once more so every every freelancer landed a, a bad project or something that he cannot achieve the first time so he goes does his homework and tries again and tries again and yeah don't be a quitter so here are the key points that you should have to be able to to register some of the platforms require the portfolio or cv they extract the the key um keywords for example i i i added my cv and they extracted that i i know html css javascript uh, swift ios etc so this saves time so you, you need a good cv a good portfolio as well some some work with the portfolio if you have a linkedin profile it would work as well then you need a list of successful projects so this is covered in the portfolio probably it could be a different document you need the time to go through the registration as well the time for taking those tests if there are any it depends on the agency some agencies are um are just happy with the portfolio and your github account some other like top tower um this turing uh, site they just want to be sure on their own that you have those competencies that you claim and you need a bank account why you need a bank account and what kind of bank, bank account you need uh it's just a regular bank account where you could get paid and some of the services don't let you finish your registration without a bank account they shouldn't know or to finish your profile you, you have to add a bank account so they can transfer you money if you earn anything and there are quite modern banks uh, or online services uh, like Revolut or PayPal or what, whatever uh, that you could use to, to have a bank account. Well, PayPal is not a regular bank, but for example, Revolut is and most of the today's bank can, can do the things for you. So I hope that I covered most of the things that you see but uh, i'll be happy to get in touch with me if you have any any questions through your journey so yeah feel free to to drop me a line when you have time thank you thank you Emil. thank you so much right so i <laughs> i would suggest to have a small break for 10 minutes and then uh we'll start with the q a session and go over all your questions. Meanwhile, guys, don't hesitate. Please bombard us with questions. We'll be happy to answer any way we can. Right. So, yeah, exactly 10 minutes break and we'll get back. All right, guys. Hello again. Sal is here. Um, I guess we are good to continue with our Q&A session. We started actually. And we have on our site Emil, who will be helping us as well as Antonia and Daniel, who are also guys to help us with the answers and jump in. Or so feel free to jump in. So I'll start with the questions one by one. Okay. The first one from Joanne, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. I want to start freelancing as a Python developer. Can you tell me what kind of hard skills will be useful for that? By hard skills, I'm assuming you mean technical skills, probably. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. Hard skills. I, I, I personally have some hard skills like punching people. But I, don't, I don't think they're <laughs> applicable for this situation. <laughs> <laughs> they help me in my career in a way, but <laughs> right. So I'm assuming technical skills will be useful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, would you like to step in, Emil? Yeah. Sure. Um... I personally, I was um, contracting as a Python developer like five years ago for at least two. Uh, and you usually need, yeah, you have to know Python, of course, but you usually need at least one framework um, next to it, like Flusk or uh, something similar to, to deliver 
uh, for solution to build sites, so to call. As well, if you you know data analysis or you can work with big data, then with Python you can do quite decent um, information filtering, and as well you can use machine learning to classify the information. So a lot of things to go through with Python, but you have to focus on, on one thing. Either you're a developer and build solutions with Python or you're a data analyst. Uh, so it's, it's up to you to decide which one is correct. But just Python, it's like, I know Java. And then when you go to the market, they will ask you, could you do that one? No, I know Python. You, you should know at least something extra to, to land the job. Right. So something extra, we can um, explain that that will be some framework. In general, yeah, exactly. if we have to extend this question, should I know, let's say, a couple of languages to be more, uh, you know, <clears throat> valuable? Appealing. Yeah, to be more appealing or valuable. I, I don't know which is the right yeah. word here. Or I should focus on one thing, but, you know, master it. Yes. Uh, well, I would go just uh, becoming a master in, in one thing. Uh, this will be like you becoming a, a proficient, <clears throat> an expert with one technology. And then you can just easily switch to other technologies. But becoming a, a master in one thing, then you'll be hard, hardly, <clears throat> sorry, hardly replaceable by anybody else, any, any, anyone average. So just try to become a proficient in one thing and then move to the other things. Uh, I, I mentioned from my experience that I was working on Android and I had to do the switch, not because I don't like Android, but because uh, most of the projects which I got through my friends were, were focused on iOS and I had no competence with, with that iOS, writing iOS apps. This is back uh, uh, like eight years ago. So it was in the beginning of iOS uh, when the, the App Store was something new. And it's, it's good just to focus on one and then move to other technologies. Yeah, stick to one at the beginning, master it, and then convert it to something else. Yes, I can confirm them that once you master uh, some technology, especially if it's a base technology like C++ or Java, uh, then it's very easy to, or sort of easy, to learn new technologies, right? Okay. Um, next question from Anastasia. How to investigate what is proper price? Ask market, is there any other base where you can look at? I believe we answered in a way to this question, but maybe we can repeat our answer. Right. Yeah, I'll try to recap. There are services that could give you information. What's the average salary per city and per profession? And as well, uh, Stack Overflow are, are doing quite a nice survey. Uh, so many developers are answering from different places in the world. So you can get some numbers, get a some understanding what's the average price for a specific domain, a specific profession and in your country or at least in Europe. And you can try to uh, come up with a reasonable price and reduce it or increase it based on what you, you see and how you feel in your skills, whether you're confident or not, and whether you can deliver, whether you have some experience uh, working as a freelancer or not. So yeah. Just go and check one one service is Glassdoor. There are a couple more. They are sharing their information for free. And you can even pay and get uh, better insights if you want to. But it's just a minimal in investment like 10 bucks uh, in the beginning just to get better understanding. As well, don't, don't be shy. Just ask uh, other freelancers, uh, people you know. They, they should feel free to share it. It's well-known secret. So yeah, just if you ask, they will 
share it with you. Thank you. Okay. Right. Next question. Good one. As a freelancer, I'm a product. I'm productive, but I feel like I'm working slowly sometimes. Should I still accept hourly charging and wait for employees' reaction about my tempo, or should I warn them about it in advance? Well, that, that's a great question. Everybody can step in, right? Because we have different people here with different professions, like Daniel is on the other side, in a way, and Antonia as well. So, guys, feel free to step in. Let, let me begin and the other guys will take over. So uh, your tempo depends more like on the complexity of the problem you're trying to solve. And if it's unexplored field for you, probably you'll be way slower. And that might be a bit disappointing for the, the client. So if he throws you in to the deep and something that you don't know how to do, how, how to tackle, then try to communicate that beforehand. Because once he starts expecting a result and you need uh, five days more to, to deliver uh, the result, then there is uh, a problem. And if you're just slow from time to time, Maybe you have different distractions, et cetera, but this is kind of normal. You, you have to set the client's expectation that this, uh, this work that you're working on will take roughly 100 hours and the, the error is uh, like 10%. So if you're uh, 10 hours more, 10 hours uh, less working on, on that problem, then obviously it's reasonable. So you have to, to manage the client's expectation first, and then you shouldn't commit things you are pretty confident that you cannot deliver. If you follow those two things, then probably you end up with a, with a good deal and the client will be happy. But this is how I say it. Uh, in the beginning, I tried to promise more than I can deliver, and there were some tough, tough moments with the client because he, he comes to me and says, I expected that to be delivered like three days ago and you, you're you still promising me that you deliver it tomorrow. <laughs> so that repeat a couple of times and uh, yeah, it's, it's a problem for uh, long-term working relationships, for healthy working relationships with that client. So be careful. Thank you. So, so the question actually is, uh, if I'm slow, should I use hourly uh, rates? Is that is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, it's it's a complex question. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I think it needs to be clear why we are slow. Uh, what is the reason behind? Uh, are we working on too many projects or or it's just one project but we're still slow um, and something that actually kind of Emil mentioned is if you're too slow compared to the competition you're going to lose your client so you need to know the reason behind why you're slow uh, the relation with the how re uh, the rate per hour um, I, I have been um, on the other side, being uh, someone that uh, hire uh, freelancers. And usually um, when I use um, a rate per hour, I separate the, the task in, in smaller tasks. So actually, if it's too sl slow for me, you might not reach the end of the project because I will control on, on little iterations and then and then I'll see that it's too slow for me as a as a as a um, as a as someone hiring a freelancer and I, and then might change change the vendor. So this is my answer. OK. 
Okay. Right. Um, if we are slow, I would say that if we are slow in the delivery because of some unexpected obstacles or uh, technical depth or something, we should inform the client as soon as possible about that and we shouldn't hide. What about the, the other way? What if I'm too fast? Let's say, because when we charge an hour, um, it's not very fair sometimes, right? What if I'm very fast? How, how, to, how to escape yeah. from that scenario, right? That, that, that depends. Well, if you're using an agency services, then they won't be happy. I, I had some problems with mm -hmm. that. I, I was just saving a lot of working hours for the agency and they were complaining that I do not work enough because they earn on top of each hour they sell <clears throat> and they weren't selling that many hours. And being more productive, it turned out to be a bad thing for, for them and for me okay. <laughs> in the long yeah. run, yeah. <laughs> which, which was quite sad. So uh, if you're working with uh, directly with a client, it might be good, but in the end, you, you won't get paid. So it's, it's good to forecast as much as possible um, how much... A, a work will take yeah as much as possible and then try to budget that one and then if you're already like a couple hours earlier then you you would you you're the guy who could decide whether you want to give this discount to the um the client or you can just try to do some other stuff uh, ironing out tiny greedy details but delivering something more stable so yeah it's up okay to Okay, uh, that was a great insight. Thank you. Okay, uh, plenty of questions, so let's move faster. Uh, which platforms are better to use for marketing purpose and social presence? Tamar, should I repeat question, guys? Oh, which... I, I heard, I heard that one. Well, for social presence, I would go with LinkedIn and um, Stack Overflow. About... How about Instagram and pictures? Oh, that, that's not okay. picture, picture of the code. It's hard. <laughs> but if you're a designer, an appropriate designer, joke, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, if you're a designer, then the, the channels are slightly different. I I cannot say that I much I have much experience, but there are like uh, Dribo social platform for designers. There. Are, different places where you can just show your art. You can even use a Facebook group just to share that you're doing awesome uh, designs of applications. So you, you have to be, uh, you have to adjust that and find the best places based on whether you're a developer or a designer or a project manager. Yeah. There is no single platform for that one unfortunately yeah you need to do your research guys and whatever we say today might be obsolete in three months right it's quite a dynamic yeah. world <laughs> okay again tamar what about open source project how testers can participate there by testers probably your uh you you mean manual qas or uh, automation qa so these are two different uh, spices right um, yeah, what I can say is that uh, the same what we explained about the developer should be applicable for the automation quality uh, testers, right? Uh, because you can you can be part of some open source project and deliver or add some set of automation tests, whether they are backend testing or end-to-end uh, -end testing doesn't matter still will bring value and will be appreciated would you agree with that Emil? yeah i think that if you're a manual manual qa or tester <clears throat> you can uh, bring a lot of value to any open source project why well uh, everyone who is going to that open source project is a user of that product so you kind of identify problems as a developer and you have the skills to, to patch that hole into the product. So either you fork it, do the technical stuff and you add that new addition to, to, 
to that product and you improve it. But if you're a tester, there are plenty of things you could do uh, on behalf of getting that open source project organized in terms of you can just uh, help the, the, the people working behind the project with uh, managing the tasks in uh, GitHub, for example. It, it depends where the, the open source project is hosted, but there is a lot of management work. There, are, there is a lot of work to do proper documentation. Uh, if you're a guy who works day to day from testing point of view of uh, this uh, product, you can record nice videos that, that will help you <clears throat> demo the functionality as well, get better in this, in this understanding, improve your communication. So a lot of things you could add to that project and you have to ask the the guys who are developing and they will find a place for you and yeah just focus on something go and ask the guys behind it and they will find a lot of things and the good thing for you is that you develop in develop different skills not only hard skills technical skills but soft skills as well okay related question to that um, how tester can create a portfolio, maybe also start a blog. That was sort of thinking out loud. Yeah. Um, again, if it is a manual tester, if you're pointing at the manual tester, probably you can work on some open source project and deliver, let's say, um, the necessary or some uh, test cases combined into test suites. Right, Emil? Yeah, 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 definitely. And you can demonstrate that. You can say, here, I contributed to this uh, <clears throat> open source project and I delivered this amount of test cases which covered this amount of functionalities. And everybody will love uh, the thing, the fact that you're uh, pointing and <laughs> expressing your achievements with facts and data. I, I want to cover one other point that's totally valid what you say, Sava, and I want to add something extra. Uh, if you're a manual tester, then you have to learn what's uh, uh, behavioral driven uh, development and testing. So basically, you're using a Gherkin language, which is simply English. We are using it in our company. That I awesome. confirm. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're a manual tester, you could try to write your test cases using that 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 style which later could be automated. But in the beginning, any tester could, could start the, the testing procedure and then the automation uh, testers will implement the steps or the developers. But there is a lot of things that you could add on top. And this will build your portfolio. So you can say, I, I added 100 for this project and now it's, uh, uh, covered more than 95% and it was like 65 or 73% covered before before I become part of it. So yeah, great contribution. Thank you. Okay. Uh, awesome question. What does it mean to sync with client? With the client? Well, it means you have to synchronize most of the key points with your client. Well, this is part of the slide. Uh, I was talking in the slides for, for the invoicing, but it's pretty much for everything. You shouldn't get in touch with the client just before the project at, in, at the end, <laughs> because the client could uh, understand that he wants something but doesn't want something else. So it's good to keep constant communication with him. And uh, I, as a developer and uh, working with my crew, I prefer to, to send builds quite regularly to, to the client doing releases so he feels part of the, the whole team. If he, he knows that we are on that page, he knows what to expect and he could navigate the process to a direction that he likes. This might slow the final result and it should be covered uh, in the contract, but this is something that you could figure out later. But it's good to keep the client in the loop because he feels part of the process and feels way happier than just uh, sending uh, an email with a version once a week. That's not good. 
Okay, I would say that it is also a way to manage clients' expectations, right? Yeah. The more often you, you, you update him, the more often you provide your updates and uh, keep him on top of what you're doing, the better. Uh, this is how the client will be happy and uh, he will be involved and also feeling that he's managing it, right? So try to be uh, in sync with your clients as many times as possible. Okay, right. Next question. I'm a junior C Sharp uh, Aspect.NET Core developer. What type of job can I do and how to find such job? Well, whatever we say to, about Python or uh, Java or some other technology is applicable for uh, .NET Core and <coughs> C Sharp. Same stuff. I don't know if we can add something specific here, right? And I'm not sure if oh. there are dedicated sites, maybe Emil, you can help me here, dedicated places or agencies only for C Sharp. No, all the uh, job boards are pretty much for any type of technology. So you just change Python with C Sharp or with uh, ISP or whatever, and you'll find different results, but I'll, I'll post a kind of thorough list uh, for the places, there are different groups for Microsoft related technologies. They're quite strong community. So I would go there and start from there and just share some experience and there will be people who will uh, give you a hand. So this is probably the best place than going to iOS community. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, the questions related to the recording and so on. Uh, you all get access to this recording once we finish the session. So it will be provided to you by the organizers. Okay, so I'll be skipping those. Okay, what can we describe in a project proposal? Or what we should describe in a project proposal if we have to rephrase the question? Well, building a good project proposal takes takes some time. And as well with, with the years, you, you kind of figure out or you make up a recipe that works. And based on the meeting with your client, you can decide which, which flavor of that recipe you should apply. But yeah, I, I, I'll try to be more, more concrete. So you have to describe the project or what you understood that the client desires, what you plan to deliver, and at what price. So those three things, what you understood the client asked, there might be gaps there, but if it's um, written on paper, then the client cannot argue. Once you sign it, it's, it, the proposal is the proof that the client agrees that he wants exactly that thing. As well, it's a proof that you will deliver what you will deliver. So it's a good thing that you know what you should deliver, but in the end, you, this could come and bite you because you might promise to deliver something which you cannot deliver in the end. And the client might have some objections, want to reduce the price. And then the, probably the most important bit is the price of the deal. So those are the three key points. Then you can fill different details, different technologies, uh, people who will be working will be involved, the time scale, et cetera. But those are details. They're kind of required to some extent, but the key points are what's the job, what you will deliver, and what's the price. Okay. Um, can we add something more here or? That should be all. Okay, let's move to the next question then. Uh, do you have good examples of freelance websites? I created mine, but I'm not sure if it's good or not. <laughs> okay, uh, that's from Georgie. That's uh, a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it, it sounds simple, um, 
different people like different different styles so what's a good <clears throat> good site if it's something quite different from from the regular developer i would say it's a good one this is something that will impress me probably but uh if you want to um advertise that you're a good developer i have to see the code so uh you have to publish it publicly and when it's a site we could consider to some extent that it's kind of open so you won't lose anything if you share it with the community so if i'm looking for a web developer to work with me on some project then now I'll, I'll be happy to check the site how it looks but i i won't be that much impressed from the the visuals yeah it will make a nice impression if there are animations etc but i want to see how you organize the things what kind of technologies whether you're using react what's the how it how the code is structured etc whether you're good using good practices to add commands to to use the different build tools etc how recent is that project how long in the time you you spend how much time you spend to, to build it so there are many different aspects uh, i would look into that site not the actual site if you're a designer then the, the look and feel is way way more impressive than how it was achieved when you're a developer it's the other way around so um, don't be afraid share how you build that site and this is what will make you better developer not whether the the button is rounded or, or squared or uh, yeah the color of the button so if you want to to make really awesome sites then join forces with a designer ask someone to to do your design and then implement it and say that you give the designer uh, a credit or just negotiate it. yeah find a, something that works for you but yeah developer for the developers the, the code matters more than the look and feel thank you um, a different type of question but i would like to involve the new as well can i start freelancing at 34 okay uh, i'm assuming gauge so <laughs> actually recently i was reading an article asking where are the old guys in our industry the guys above 40 above 50 where are they and the answer was simple all of them are freelancing right uh, in the IT industry exists something called ageism, right? Um, because it's believed that only younger guys can deliver uh, code and can work like many, many hours weekly. That is why actually freelancing is good after a certain age and you are more relaxed in a way and experienced. That would be my thoughts and what I observed, but I'll let the colleagues jump in so if we uh, we are looking for some correlation between age and starting a free ones job then um i would say it depends on the the particular free ones skill set um for some of the skills you can start as junior as possible you can open a profile in, in a freelance network and or a platform and you might be successful to 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 sell but for some other uh professions for some other skill sets uh it will be probably impossible without having a significant experience behind and if we have to give some examples i would say that a junior um a junior web developer will be for him or her it will be easy to start as junior in a in a freelance environment but um let's say a security consultant this is something that uh experience is required before starting a freelance freelance job I would add also that uh, when you are freelancing and working remotely, no one is asking about your age, right? Everybody's asking what you can do. So 
I would say you can start whenever you want, as long as you have the will and <clears throat> the desire to do that and to be to commit. Other than that, there are no limitations. From my perspective, of course. And I support. sorry, I support that. Yeah, I would just provide an example. One of the best C++ developers I know started uh, C++ in, he was 54 or something, in his 50s, right? And he's one of the top uh, developers I know in C++, and he's gaining a lot, a lot of money. And it's just because he's super smart. So the edge doesn't matter. It's just, uh, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Uh, other questions? Uh, today's an introductory session. I wonder when the group will be recruited and I will be notified about these trainings. I'm not sure how to answer this question. We have these uh, webinars, three in a row with three different topics. First one is freelancing. Second one is product management. Third one is career development. So you're not catching up late. Uh, today, today's topic is freelancing. Okay. Okay. Other. Can you recall a case when you came across or got stuck on a problem longer than you planned? What happens in case of such unforeseen obstacles if they interfere with the deadline? Of course, plenty of times, but how let <laughs> 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 well, I, I think this is part of the job, just solving unsolvable things or just find a way around them. So the last time I think was uh, last November, so a couple of months ago. So we kind of promised something. We've done a proper investigation of, of the problem and it turned out that it's impossible. What they asked uh, to implement is part of Electron uh, open source project and it's planned to not be delivered at all because they're dropping uh, some, some stuff in the next releases and either we stick to what we have or, or we cannot support that feature. And we had another get together meeting with, with the client and we discussed our findings and try to come up with better solutions or understanding they took that internally, they discussed it, and we figured out that there was a business discussion that at some point we, we, they should let it go. So that was like in, in external force that pushed towards that decision. So as a takeaway, just communicate with the client at the first moment when you understand there is a problem. Don't postpone it. The client will be disappointed if you uh, procrastinate that, that thing and you're just delaying the, the actual outcome. If you have a hunch uh, that you might solve it, then bring him the bad news, say that you have an idea and you need more time, but prepare him in a way that there might be no other solution than dropping that feature off the list and thinking in another direction. There are a lot of hidden walls that you could hit. So communication is the key here. Should we be completely open with our clients or to what extent? It, it depends, the, the trust should be mutual so and it builds with the time and with different situations solving different problems um, spending time together yeah working on a project i mean so mm -hmm. it, it depends you get a feeling whether you could share it or not in the beginning if you're too open you might scare the client or make a, a wrong impression so don't be too much open or uh, pour a lot of technical details if you're a developer and you're being a freelancer, just try to, to do better manager. So yeah, try to communicate 
bit by bit, not pouring a lot of information and uh, putting the client into bad situation, whether he cannot make a decision because he is not an expert in that domain. Just share by bit by bit, try to understand his understanding about the problem. Try to clarify that one. I, I said the clients are not stupid. They just pretend you have to share enough details until you, until you understand that they feel comfortable making the decision, but you shouldn't decide instead of them because at some point they might say, I haven't decided that one. I don't want to work with you. So there are such clients. So be careful, be proactive, propose uh, solutions, but never implement those on your own. Try to, to make the client uh, see those. You, you have to present them and yeah, step by step. Thank you. Okay. Uh, questions related to the presentation? Yes, the PowerPoint will be shared with you guys. So don't need to ask. I'll repeat. PowerPoint will be shared with you as well as the recording once the session is over. No need to ask about that any longer. Okay. <clears throat> right. Hey, thanks for your presentation. I've joined late. I could not understand which platform have you been talking about when you said you had invested three months to build your profile. Uh, it was me who was, who was explaining that, and I was referring to uh, crossover for work. Same is applicable for uh, TopTal, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and all those agencies, or most of them, which are globally presented and where you're aiming for the big bucks, uh, usually it requires a lot of time, investment for you to step in there. Uh, <clears throat> to get into the <clears throat> marketplace. Um, the higher the pay, <laughs> the more investment is required. That's uh, obvious. Okay. Okay. Uh, just want to, yeah, steal the focus a bit. I'm, I'm just sharing, if I'm still sharing, I'm yes. just showing the Trello platform. So this is a platform where you have different boards. And on those boards, you could define different buckets. And in each bucket, you could define different tasks. Yeah, for example, this is from one of our clients. So this is a brief description of the task. You can attach links or images. You can assign members yeah. assigned to that task. Right now, yeah, this is in the down column, but you could define the new tasks. Here is the to-do one. The one in progress and done this pretty basic uh, division of all the, the the things that you should work on and then you can fill different details into here and just manage that easily and you, uh, all the good thing is that you can add as many users as you want uh, the only limit for the free version is that you can have like 10 boards or i'm, I'm not sure how much they, they just increased that one quite recently but yeah, and per project, you can have a board or you can create a new organization, have several projects, uh, several boards for that project. So it's up to you. It's a good thing. It, there are some sort of automations and you can apply for a pro plan. A lot of good things are added on top. So if you add uh, some something like a estimate example, you, you think this task will work like 10 hours of work then you can reorder the things, et cetera. So you can start with the pretty basics and then just grow step by step. But it's good for small projects and freelancers. And there was a question in the questions, why is Zoho not Asana? So Trevo is the alternative of, of Asana. Asana is another um, service, it's good. There, there is this one, Monday, they heavily advertised on YouTube recently. There a lot more others that are trying to steal the focus from Trevo. Trevo is uh, quite popular and it was uh, bought by the developers of uh, uh, Jira. Uh, so 
if you know Trello, the others are pretty much similar, but it's up to you. The clients come up with different uh, management tools. So probably you will adjust, but if you know Jira or Trello, you're kind of set for the beginning. And uh, yeah, one, one more thing. Zoho is a service for email and CRM. It's not a uh, managing tool. It's for managing the clients, sending emails, keeping track of, of the clients, not managing projects. So they're two different things. And Zoho provide similar services as well. GitHub it has quite nice board for, for something similar to Trello. So it depends on your project and what you want to do, but there are a lot of alternatives here. Yeah, uh, Trello is, the learning curve for Trello is small, right? It's very simple to understand and to use. So that's a good start, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Right, there is a, a great question from Anna. Hello. What do you think about combining being developer and IT manager? I'm really in love with developing, but I also am interested in making projects from the beginning, from planning to analytics. Thank you. I, I love this question, right? Uh, I, I would say the following. Uh, in my career, I've witnessed plenty of times where decent developers, wh whenever you, you use in love with development for God's sake, continue with the development, right? Uh, because I saw guys who, for plenty of reasons, wanted to upgrade, let's say, to a managers. And being a manager is an awful thing, right? Because you have to leave aside the development and focus on plenty of other things like people management, negotiations, issues, tensions every day. And they give up after a month. Oh, please get me back to the development. I, I, I cannot take this any longer. So my personal advice, of course, it's from my perspective. If you are in love with the development, stay with it and don't jeopardize it with management stuff. But only if you're interested, you're really interested. Usually, if you work in a team, um, by natural way, the team will point you as a, as the leader. Sometimes it happens like that, uh, naturally. So that would be my thoughts, and I'll let the colleagues to express their <clears throat> thoughts. Oh, I would say become a freelancer. You have pretty much from everything. You'll be a developer in the evening. You'll be a manager in the morning. So yeah, it's a mixture of all those things and being a freelance manager that might be hard there you, you have to use agency so the agency secure the team and you step in that role so there are ways around that one i i cannot say that it's good or bad either you like to do management things and uh, work with the bigger picture or you like to solve problems it's up to you you have to make the decision in the end which one you will be better at so you have to try once you try you can decide thank you uh daniel from your perspective as an expert hr expert and so on what would be your advice here So I, 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 at the beginning, I saw this question that is more, not, I mean, I don't see the, the HR perspective. If you repeat it again. Uh, let's say someone is in love with the development, but also in this, is interested in management. Let's say this, let's say this way. Should he go for it or continue with the development? Uh, actually, uh, from my practice, I, mm -hmm. I saw a lot of people having this dilemma, but mm -hmm. uh, but they are really quick in taking the decision. I mean, they follow their 
usually they're hard they don't want to do to do the management side so actually they tried sometimes for a few months and they see that uh, especially people management it's not for them and they go back to the development so um my advice here is try it uh if it's possible so like try with we try it with small projects try to manage people the the biggest challenge here is i think is people management i mean uh because actually it's much more complex uh than for example you you might manage a process you might manage manage um um you know some, something else that you know it's not but if you manage people then it, it becomes really annoying sometimes and and if you have a chance in your organization uh then you should ask for um a possibility to try to manage people like for example leading a small project first to test it and if it's fine for you uh and you don't want to miss the and you you're ready to 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 you know to miss the development side so maybe it's better to have um, um this managerial position because actually uh this will uh, create much greater value to the organization because your skills will be transferred to much many people and and the quality probably will increase but again <clears throat> if it's not your thing then st stick to the development thank you thank you daniel okay uh Another question, I don't know, it's, is it just for fun or provocative, but I'm a fiber optic cable welder, and what can I do to find freelancer work? Okay. <laughs> I don't know how no. to answer. Hello. Uh, I, I, it, it, go on, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. No, no, go ahead. Uh, okay, I'll take it like provocative, and I'll yeah. say make a video like uh, in YouTube and uh, earn some money from advertisement. <laughs> that, that was a great suggestion, by the way. I never thought about it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Right. Um, why NGA is not good, thanks. I believe we answered that, but again, Emil, if you can recap in a few sentences, why the NDA is not good? Yeah, the NDA is not good only in one case. If you aim to something, you don't have, you haven't started it, and there is a client which asks you to do something similar. And if you sign the NDA, it, uh, the NDA, it depends on the NDA, of course, but usually the NDA blocks you, prevents you start working on your idea. If those if the NDA and your dream idea kind of clash, in general, NDA is a good thing. It protects you and the client. But if you're striving for the same thing, the same sort of a product, let's say a game or, I don't know, any financial software or whatever it is, or the new Bitcoin, <laughs> if you both want to, to do crypto stuff, then it might be a problem in the long run. So once you sign that NDA, you uh, you cannot start doing it uh, straight away. You have to create different companies, work in the shadow. So it's it might be a bad thing. It might be a bad thing. So be careful when signing such uh, contracts or obligation documents. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, question from Chakro. If you are in a narrow field, for example, you only know one software like Tableau or Power BI, is it possible to start freelancing? Uh, definitely yes. In these agencies that we mentioned, there was, there were, and there are still uh, openings for BI guys using Tableau or Power BI. That would be my answer, but I'll let them know as an expert. Well, there are a lot of BI consultants and knowing such powerful tools would make you stand out. They, those are quite modern, but there are plenty of, of those. So uh, those are niche things, but every big company 
is looking for consultants who could help them read the numbers. So if you're good with reading the numbers, then there will be place for you. And if you're really, really good, you stand out from the crowd, then you deserve your, your payment and you'll be paid quite high. I, I, I tried to be a BI consultant for a couple of months. I don't like it. Maybe because I, I wasn't good enough. So I, I decided to quit that thing. Provocative question from me. Why you try that? Is it because of the money or just the interest? Uh, it be was honest. Because, yeah, it was because we have a quite good uh, lecture at the university. Uh, I, I started like an intern, so <laughs> there was no money involved yet. Um, uh, maybe it was part about the money because I, I learned that if you have like 10, 12 years of experience, you will be really well paid. Um, yeah, to some extent, probably. But on the other hand, this uh, lecture of ours uh, inspired us. And uh, I saw a lot of mathematics and I, I, I'm with... Uh, uh, informatics background so I kind of love it at some point but it turns out to be way more mathematics and discussion with the clients which I um, I wasn't good um, back then um, so yeah tried two three months whole, uh, getting to a lot of meetings trying to do some simple projects tools it wasn't for me so stop doing that Thank you. Okay. Ninia, I started learning country development at my 27. What would be better option to gain experience? Start freelancing independently or joining some company or group as a junior or intern? Hmm. Oh. <laughs> That's easy. The mother of uh, all questions, right? Uh, yeah. Would you share your opinion? Then I'll, I'll just try to share my opinion. My. Would be the following again. Probably it will be provocative, but I would say the following: the companies, the corporations, from my perspective, are a bad thing for juniors, even for senior guys. Uh, usually, they will put you on some legacy stuff or some legacy codes, or they will put you on something very small, and you will master only fixing some small issues or stuff. If you start day one uh, with the uh, freelancing, you'll be like swimming in the deep sea day one. Either you will learn to swim, either you will <laughs> just dive. That will be my answer. I understand well, that it's provocative. I, I would agree. It's It depends on you. If you have the, the stamina, the power to survive in such rough conditions, probably going on your own is the best way because you gain more and more because you're capable. But if you're a shy guy or a girl and you want someone to take your hand and lead you through all the problems and be more confident before uh, going to the deep water, then you have to find the, the best corporation like uh, Sava said. Not all big companies will give you what you dream of or what you uh, get promised on the interview <laughs> be ready to, to switch positions if you're if you want to grow rapidly be ready to change places to change works it's it's not good for your cv but staying at the same place fixing legacy bugs <laughs> is worse so yeah i totally agree with sava uh, if you want i will add the hr view on that yeah uh, it, it depends actually on the uh, on the personal learning style because actually you you do have at least four types of learning uh, styles and and people are different so some people prefer to uh, learn a lot alone um, looking to some videos and on some online trainings or stuff like that but there are people that are learning from other people. Um, other people are learning from from experience. 
So <clears throat> if you know well your learning style, where you're good on, then you can um, answer this question. And actually in company, if you work in a company, even, even a smaller company like 10, 20 people, um, and if you learn from people well, then your, your learning experience will be much better than if you try to learn alone as a freelancer. Sorry, my dog is barking. Uh, yeah, basically, different point of views, right? It's up to you. But yeah, uh, just give it a try. Okay. Can I send my website URL to someone who is developer from your site and get feedback? I'm not sure about this one. I personally cannot provide feedback for a website. I'm very far from that. But if someone else is willing to. Um, I think we 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 had something planned. Maybe Nikolai can shed some light that we'll check some of the the CVs or something like that. But I, I forgot what was the the idea. Well, George, feel free to to message us. We we'll, I'll, I'll take a look. Yeah, we'll we'll take a look later and get back to you. We, we don't know at the moment. But definitely we'll get back to you. Yeah. Okay, last question from the question list. What is the key message when I submit a proposal? What should I focus on? We answered in a way in different similar question. What I can share, I don't know if it's still applicable, but when I started to send proposal initially, I was trying to do them perfect, very comprehensive, over 40 pages with all the details and so on. And then I realized that the client are just checking the prices and whether we meet each other in the expectations. So what I did is three pages, first page, what I'm going to do, second page, what it will cost you, third page, my references. Um, Emil, would you like to step in or maybe you can? Oh, we can discuss this website of Georgie live. Okay. Yeah, if he's not afraid of doing that, but if he no. shares. Yeah, if, if you're afraid, if you're afraid, just let us know. Um, okay, uh, let's try to answer the, the, the previous question. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll discuss that thing. Uh, what was the previous one? Can you just what we should uh, focus on in the proposal yeah yeah in the proposal yeah well you shouldn't dive too much into too much details it's like you, you can just make a draft of the proposal send something which looks like a draft uh, where you just sketch the, the most important things and those are uh, what you understood from the client that should be done uh, you should be on the same page he wants something at least you should think that you're on the same page i'm not sure whether any client is on the same page with the developers but yeah with the process they they align to each other so you should know that thing then you should describe what you are going to deliver then the price the price is a key point and the references it's a good addition but probably if you uh, it depends on the, on the client, but if you are talking and you're sending a proposal, you probably skip the, the you're already skip the phase with, with the references. But it depends if you're using some of the platforms, then add the references. They will just skip them if they are not interested. Okay, let's, let's check the, the site. <clears throat> like the final thing for this evening, that will be a great exercise. Let's, let's go for it. Okay, so what what we see here is uh, <clears throat> something like a site that uh, is uh, acting as a portfolio slash CV. And I see that the most important things on the left, which is quite good, and as well different external sources that prove um, uh, that George 
um, is a developer and his skills. So, so far we, we can think that the site is something that he builds and he can fake it. But through the other platforms, we can see uh, George in different light and um, just try to better understand him and to check whether he's a good match for uh, my project, my team, or whatever I'm, I'm going to, to, to do. And if he's going to, to apply for a job, we can just check it here. Uh, he, he has started uh, listing the experience uh, with the most recent one, which is awesome. Uh, I would probably uh, try to make all those kind of evenly uh, distributed, try to add a bit more text here, trying to um, stress more on uh, the specific skills, the different things that uh, I'm doing at, at this position, why I decided to, to do that thing. Why, what is different with, with this company than the, the rest, what I have learned, what I'm, if it's the same thing, just, um, be creative. Try to to pick up the the most uh, important or, or most beautiful thing you have created as a front end developer. So so far it's it's good. Just try to to add a bit more detail so we know that at uh, TBC you've done something special. Uh, then the education. universities, um, maybe you can add some, some links to, to those uh, institutions, uh, you combinator, et cetera, the, the, the people who come here might won't be interested if they haven't heard some of those, they might be interested to, to check why, it's, why you think it's, it's good and uh, how many uh, graduates are from this uh, specialty and from this master program. So as well, I would add some description, what kind of uh, things I've learned, why I, I spent three years at the university studying what I gained. It, it's good to have it. If it's not on this page, if you want to keep it concise, then just add an extra page, find more etc what kind of projects you've been doing here but it's not required it's a good thing how I'm, I'm just trying to say how you can improve skills oh where are your projects here skills i would either list some projects or if I click then some, you can use this space here to, to list the projects. Obviously you've done this site, you, you can just list it here or there just to clarify that you've used some of those technologies developing this thing. Interests. Maybe probably you have some photos because I saw an Instagram profile. Maybe you can just link it here. Yeah, and the awards uh, and certificates uh, section is quite impressive. So if you have uh, some photos pro proves that they really exist, not just on words, then it would be awesome. Just uh, yeah, picture you smiling with the team or yeah getting this third place award. So it would be nice just to, to click and see that thing in time and just cross check it. Uh, development wise, I, I, I can just check the source code, but I, I think it won't be interesting and it's not for that session. So if you feel confident, please share it on GitHub and send it over. I, I can just take a look as well. But overall, it's quite good looking and uh, you can just tweak a bit the content and make it a bit more interactive and it's it's really a good good one yeah it's a good one as a hiring manager i would jump in immediately 
I mean, I would call you <laughs> in 30 minutes. Yeah, I wanted to share that actually it's, uh, uh, you receive much more uh, calls from recruiters than calls from clients, um, uh, especially if it's a public page. Um, the only thing that I saw is that <clears throat> uh, it, people that are good in front end, they tend to use much more icons, which is great and it, it contributes to the good looking of the, of the site. But from another point of view, it's always better to, to write it down because of the search engines and, and because of the recruiters also, because some of the skills probably are not going to be recognized with the icons only in the skill section, for example. Yeah, um, well, I think there is, see, there is these two tips, so probably it depends. The, yeah, the, the search engine optimization could. Yeah, the, the search engine will get it, but but the search engines in the recruiter sites, I mean, if this is applauded uh, in a recruiter site, then, then it's not going to be uh, considered. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So I, I would elaborate more on the skills. This is quite fancy. I, I like this condensed style, but sometimes it's good just to, to list it the old way with, with text. I, I completely support you. And as we see, it's mobile friendly. That's why I resize the browser. Yeah, good one. Yeah, it's a good one. And for the rest, you could just add the link to a conventional PDF download, let's say, to download your CV. OK. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I guess we are done for this evening. Uh, thank you as well, Georgie, for sharing with us your site. Uh, thank you very much, guys. It's been a great experience this evening, as usual. Plenty of questions, plenty of participants. Hopefully, uh, we were of some use for you. Please don't forget to fill, fill out our feedback form in order for us to improve as well. Thanks a lot, and see you next time on our product management session. See ya. Cheers. Goodbye. Thanks, colleagues. Cheers. Bye.